This is module eight of preparing Alaska's cultural organizations for emergencies. I'm Lori Foley and I coordinate the Heritage Emergency National Task Force. I'll be referring to the task force by its acronym, HENTEF. Otherwise, it's quite a mouthful and I'd probably be talking for another 10 minutes. As HENTEF coordinator, I work in that unique space where cultural heritage and emergency management intersect. HENTEF's mission is based on connecting the cultural community with the emergency management community. Each community has a separate vocabulary and different priorities following a disaster. These two communities need to understand each other and work together to protect our cultural heritage. As you've heard throughout this program, successful response recovery depends on building and fostering relationships. When, not if, your organization experiences an emergency or disaster, you will need to draw upon these relationships. And you're now part of a network where you can help each other when the need arises. And I really applaud you for making that commitment. HENTEF is a public-private partnership sponsored by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the Smithsonian Institution. Specifically, FEMA's Office of Environmental Planning and Historic Preservation, and the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative, which I'll be referring to as SCRI. Together, we advocate for the protection of cultural heritage. HENTEF's focus is on domestic disasters and emergencies. SCRI's focus is international. When I speak to emergency managers, I often find that I have to explain the term cultural heritage, and this is what I call them. Cultural and historic resources are held in the public trust by cultural heritage institutions that range from A to Z. These institutions hold the collective history of our communities, our states, our territories, our tribes, and our nation. They anchor us to our community identity. They educate us. They serve as gathering places for healing and spiritual renewal and even cell phone charging. They're responsible for continuity of government. When disaster strikes a community, recovery of these very institutions is vital for the economic, social, artistic, religious, and civic life of that community. If these institutions don't recover, the community never fully recovers. You know this. And you can use these points when you connect with your municipal, borough, and state emergency managers. And I hope you do make that effort to connect. You've seen the Pentagon graphic of the emergency cycle, and here's one that's a circle. It reinforces the iterative, iterative nature of disaster planning, but it can also seem like you're forever repeating the same mistakes and you're right back where you started. So I'm gonna show you yet another depiction in the next slide. As you've been learning, a good disaster plan can take many forms. Your job is to ensure that all the basic elements are included and that the format is appropriate for your organization. As Danya pointed out in module seven, one of the most critical aspects of disaster preparedness is planning, making time with your colleagues to assess the current situation of your institution and to prepare for a variety of disaster scenarios. The facet of the emergency cycle that's too often left out of a disaster plan is recovery. So much effort is put into planning how you'll respond, but you also need to figure out how your organization will get back on its feet. Karen Gray spoke about continuity of operations a vital component of recovery. And as you'll see, the road to recovery is far longer and will consume much more energy and dollars than response. FEMA looks at emergency management as a continuum. Response comprises the actions undertaken immediately after an incident. Danya walked you through those immediate response steps in module seven. Recovery is the much longer and much more challenging phase of the emergency cycle. You can see that it overlaps with response, 
And there really is no magic date when response ends and recovery begins. The actions undertaken during the days following an event can also be considered short-term recovery. Recovery can run from weeks to months to years and even to decades. Think about the Florence floods and the Katrina Recovery Office is still staffed more than 15 years after that event. In a little while, I'll talk a bit more about the two national planning frameworks that are noted at the top, the National Response Framework and the National Disaster Recovery Framework. HENTEF operates in all phases of the emergency continuum and has formal roles under both of those frameworks. However, our largest role is in helping private nonprofit arts and cultural organizations respond to and recover from disasters. For cultural institutions, recovery has the following objectives. First and foremost, as all your instructors have said, you must ensure the safety and well being of everyone staff, volunteers, board members, vendors, first responders. You want to mitigate damage to both the collections and the facility or the structure. So, staff need to know what to do and what not to do. The more effective the mitigation, the lower the cost of treatment, repair, and restoration. The mantra is document, document, document. If you plan to seek FEMA funding, documentation can spell the difference between being eligible to receive funding or being denied. You have to stabilize the temperature and relative humidity or else as James had pointed out, you'll be leaving your collections that have not been damaged at great risk of becoming damaged. And you certainly wanna save as much of the collections as possible, keeping both your collection priorities and your salvage priorities in mind. And finally, you wanna get your organization back to business as soon as possible. I'm sure you felt that as you've been merging from the strictures of the pandemic. This seems like a tidy list but it's anything but. In a few slides, we're gonna take an in-depth look at number one, applying for FEMA public assistance. But you'll be dealing with numbers two through five simultaneously and well, as well as number one, and each will progress along different timelines. And you'll be updating your incident action plan continuously as you juggle each element in each of those steps. The goal is to reopen with healthy staff able to adjust to the new normal. Enough cannot be said of the emotional, behavioral, and physical impact of a disaster on staff and volunteers. Some may not want to return if their life's work has been destroyed, and that's okay. Each of us reacts to trauma very differently. So when does the government get involved in disasters? It can be for any of these events. They can range from emergencies to disasters to catastrophic events, which are defined in the national response framework as events that result in extraordinary levels of mass casualties, damage or disruption severely affecting the population, infrastructure, environment, economy, national morale, or government functions. I think they're missing culture in that description. The Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act, or the Stafford Act, gives the president the power to declare a national emergency in response to a national disaster. This declaration allows the president to access funds and disaster relief assistance set aside by Congress. The declaration is mainly intended to assist states, territories, and tribes while they carry out their responsibilities to help their citizens. To help you understand the federal approach to disasters, I'm gonna provide you with some more background information, more FEMA speak, um, so brace yourself. FEMA divides the US into 10 regions, and as you all know, hopefully, Alaska is in FEMA region 10, along with Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. 
And there's a very specific process to declaring a major disaster. After an event occurs, officials in your state will begin collecting information about damage from local officials. Yet another reason for you to make those connections with local officials. If it's apparent that a presidential disaster declaration may be necessary to help the impacted area, the state and or tribal government contacts the FEMA Region 10 office and requests a preliminary damage assessment or PDA. It's called a joint preliminary damage assessment because it's conducted by the state and FEMA. These joint teams then begin conducting assessments of the affected areas. Sometimes they're done, and certainly during the period of COVID, they were done by phone, they were done with drones, uh, they were done by windshield assessments where people were in cars and driving by, but not really able to talk to um, the people who were affected. The joint teams are trying to determine the extent of the disaster, its impact on individuals and public facilities, and the types of federal assistance that may be needed. If the state determines that the damage is so overwhelming that it needs help to respond and recover, the governor or the tribal chief executive requests a declaration from the president through the FEMA Region 10 office. The FEMA regional administrator reviews the request, makes sure that it's pretty close to being accepted, and then sends his or her recommendation to the president. All emergency and major disaster declarations are made solely at the discretion of the president of the United States. When a major disaster is declared, PENTEF, even with Smithsonian support, can't possibly address all the concerns of the cultural and historic communities. So we amplify our preparedness, response, and recovery messaging through our 62 federal agency oops, and national service organizations. The 18 federal agencies are shown in red at the top. Among its federal members are culture-related agencies such as the Library of Congress and the National Archives and Records Administration. Important funding agencies include the Small Business Administration and the endow Endowments for the Arts and Humanities. Our 44 national service organizations, the private nonprofit professional or trade organizations are shown in black. And these members represent various sectors, the arts, culture, historic preservation, emergency management and tribal interests. Each private nonprofit member of HENTEF has a network of stakeholders and the ability to push HENTEF information down to their local constituents in the impacted states. Under the National Response Framework, HENTEF supports Emergency Support Function 11, or ESF 11, Agriculture and Natural Resources. Even though you don't see the word culture in the title, except in the word agriculture, um, it's nestled in there. HENTEF works closely with one of the primary agencies, the Department of the Interior. Specifically, the DOI office that's charged with protecting natural and cultural resources and historic properties. Following a major disaster, HENTEF coordinates the collection and sharing of information with federal, state, regional, and local entities. When there's advance warning of an approaching event, such as a hurricane, a heads up preparedness email is sent to the entities that are listed here. While you won't be subject to hurricanes in Alaska, you can still very much face flooding. These preparedness tips include, make sure your contact list is up to date. Make sure you have virtual access to procedures or paper, even better paper access to the procedures that are gonna get your business up and running again. And the most basic advice of be safe and monitor the storm. So I have to, of course, make sure that the HANTEF members are apprised of what's going on so they can push the information out to their stakeholders. I have to keep FEMA leadership apprised of what's going on because what is happening with the cultural community is 
pushed upward to senior leadership. So hopefully that information is wrapped into how FEMA is deciding to respond and recover. The state cultural agencies would include, of course, your usual suspects of the state library, the state archives, and the state museum, but also our state arts councils, state humanities councils, the state historic preservation office, and state parks. In addition to the state agencies, there are state and regional associations, centers that provide preservation education or conservation treatment, and volunteer networks committed to assisting cultural institutions. So when there's an event, and I have to say when, not if, um, if there's an event, when there's an event in Alaska, such as a flood or an earthquake or a wildfire that's gonna rise to the level of federal intervention, I'm gonna reach out to Angeli and her colleagues at the other state cultural agencies to have them and to suss out what the extent and severity of damage is. Angeli and her colleagues are then gonna reach out to you as the boots on the ground. And better yet, it would be wonderful if you can be proactive and contact your sector's state agency. Because I count on these relays to gather what's known as situational awareness, knowing what's going on. Following a major disaster, I'll often convene a HENTEF coordination call with all those suspects listed in the previous slide. If a major disaster occurs that affects cultural and historic resources in Alaska, you'll be invited to this call through your sector's state agency. This call is an opportunity for cultural stewards to share reports of damage with emergency managers. You're elevating this information to them and then they can help direct you to assistance. And the they would include me as well. These calls also connect the state's cultural community with resources available from HENTEF's members. Emergency managers should reach out to cultural stewards as key stakeholders in their community to find out if damage has occurred and to determine any unmet needs. But you can't count on that happening. So you as cultural stewards need to know to report that damage to your local emergency manager. Again, all disasters are local. HENTEF is a supporting organization of the Natural and Cultural Resources Recovery Support Function of the National Disaster Recovery Framework, or in shorthand, the NCR RSF of the NDRF. That's how we speak. We speak in jar jargon at FEMA. Here too, we work very closely with the Department of the Interior, the coordinating agency for this RSF. Among our many RSF actions, we deliver technical assistance, guidance, and resources by drawing from the diverse expertise of all of our members. These are photos of mission assignments coordinated with DOI of deployed staff from federal HENTEF members. In the left and middle photos, US Virgin Islands legislative records badly damaged by Hurricane Irma, and that's probably an understatement, were assessed in full PPE. On the right, following Hurricane Maria, HENTEF worked with five federal agencies to bring training in mold removal and health and safety to Puerto Rico's cultural stewards. When responding to an incident, how do we know? How does the local or borough emergency manager know? Which institutions have been affected? and which ones have not, if the full universe of institutions is not known. This slide, whoops, not this slide, this slide. This slide shows a portion of the master list of North Carolina cultural institutions and arts organizations. Many years ago, with an IMLS connecting to collections grant, North Carolina state cultural agencies pooled their lists of museums, libraries, archives, historical societies, and government records into one master list. With few resources to maintain that list, once the grant expired, the list grew, as you can imagine, somewhat outdated. Following Hurricane Dorian in 2019, North Carolina asked Hentef if we could help update that list. 
So I turned to the Smithsonian Cultural Rescue Initiative interns to update data and populate missing fields. Unfortunately, such data sets don't exist across most states. And they're usually compiled after a disaster, if they're compiled at all, which is not an ideal time to generate lists when cultural institutions are in the throes of response and recovery efforts. HENTEF is now collaborating with Oregon to compile such a list following their devastating wildfires. And we're also working with Delaware and New Jersey, states that haven't suffered a major disaster recently to get their lists pulled together before disaster strikes. And I'd love to work with you to compile a master list for Alaska. Using the data collected following Dorian, Hentef worked with federal partners to create a public facing GIS map layer of cultural institutions in three affected states. And here you see North Carolina. Clicking on any of the blue pins will identify that institution and provide some other information. Such a map will be helpful in the future, certainly for North Carolina, but in general, for preparedness messaging. Now we know who could be impacted by riverine flooding, storm surge, and other potential hazards. Pulling together that data set isn't the hard part. Maintaining that data is the challenge. HENTEF turns that list back over to the state once it's been compiled. So it's incumbent upon states to maintain that data, which should be updated at least annually. And the data are also valuable, especially valuable, when an event does not rise to the level requiring federal engagement and you will be working with state agencies. Public Assistance, or PA, is the program by which governmental institutions and eligible private nonprofits can receive federal disaster assistance. I have to admit, it's a difficult program to navigate. Knowing what this process entails before a disaster strikes is so important so you're not trying to make sense of the process in the midst of chaos and stress. Arts organizations and cultural institutions that have been impacted by a declaration disaster, declared disaster, can be eligible for federal assistance via FEMA's PA program and or through the Small Business Administration disaster loans. If your institution is affiliated with a government agency or is a government agency, so if your institution is a state university or a borough or a municipality, you should notify your superior, your upper level agency regarding your damage and any expenses that you've been putting out to protect your facilities. The following information doesn't necessarily apply to your institution because your expenditures are going to be included as part of your government agencies list, but only if you make them aware of your damage. One, file a claim with your insurance company immediately. That means you need to know who your insurance contacts are and how to reach them. You need to know what kind of coverage you have. You need to know who the policy holder is and what the policy numbers are. You need to know the cause of the incident, the kind of damage, where and when the damage was discovered, the extent of the damage and the steps taken that you've the steps that you've taken to prevent further damage. Remember the mantra, document, document, document. This is why. I am not an expert about insurance. Uh, there are people at, Feder at, at FEMA who do nothing but read people's insurance, policy, insurance policies to ensure that there's no overlap in, in funding. Um, so I'm not gonna be able to provide you guidance. Uh, in the resources section though, I'll, I'll have included a few links to recorded insurance webinars that are available through the Connecting to Collections Care online community. And again, Please don't be afraid to ask your insurance agent or agents to come by for a site visit and to explain your coverage. You need to be prepared. Two, file for FEMA public assistance. 
The deadline for filing for public assistance is 30 days from the date of the disaster declaration for your borough. So unless the same disaster declaration is for all of Alaska, those dates may vary by days or weeks and even months. DHS and EM website, your Alaska Emergency Management Agency has a form, a request for public uh, a, risk, a request for public assistance form um, that you can fill out. Remember, if you miss the deadline, you can't get any FEMA funding through public assistance. And as you know, funding for cultural institutions is hard to come by in the best of times. And if you dismiss public uh, assistance outright, you're eliminating one of the few sources of recovery funding, federal or private. You may find after you start exploring and looking into it that PA is not for your organization. You may not have suffered the minimum amount of damage that's covered. You may not have the staffing to keep up with the paperwork, which is pretty substantial. And you may simply not have the bandwidth to apply within that 30 day period after the declaration, but it's still very much worth exploring. Three. Federal regulations require cultural institutions and arts organizations to apply for a disaster loan through the Small Business Administration before they can receive any funding for permanent work through the public assistance program. If denied by the SBA, or if your costs are more than what the SBA covers, then FEMA might be able to provide you with assistance. You don't have to accept the loan offer, but you still have to apply if you want to pass go and get to the next step in the process. And I'll speak more specifically about the SBA loan process shortly. The Public Assistance Program and Policy Guide on the right is the reference for public assistance. Uh, we fondly refer to it as Papa G. The graphic on the right shows how complicated the process is. So it's best that you become familiar with the PA process on blue sky days when you're not in the throes of a disaster. And at 277 pages, Papa G is really also a great treat, a great antidote for insomnia. Private nonprofit organizations are considered non-critical private nonprofits that provide other essential social type services to the community. So your arts organization or cultural institution may be eligible for public assistance. Papa G refers to the larger cultural community and includes references to the arts community. But unfortunately, when um, this whole recovery document uh, guidance was updated, they, they rolled in all the separate entries that relate to cultural institutions and cultural collections. So there are no longer sections devoted specifically to cultural institutions. You have to search for relevant information using the term museum or cultural resources. If you search for culture, you're gonna end up getting a lot of references to agriculture. The Small Business Administration makes several types of loans available to private nonprofits. They include business physical disaster loans for the repair or replacement of real estate, equipment, furniture, and so on. Economic injury disaster loans for working capital to help small businesses impacted by a disaster survive until normal operations can resume. And mitigation loans to make mitigation improvements to prevent future loss from disasters. The decision tree diagram on the left shows how eligibility is determined. It's complicated. I'm not gonna walk you through, but I promise if there's a major disaster, when there's a major disaster um, in Alaska, I will rejoin, I will reapproach Angeli and we'll talk you through this decision tree. To make matters harder, FEMA PA and the SBA deadlines don't align. And they can be pushed later, uh, depending on the requests made by the state. So you really have to track those deadlines. And for the SBA or for FEMA, 
please don't be afraid to contact them for assistance. So we're back to that recovery to-do list. FEMA funding can cover numbers two through five. And here's something you really have to remember. Public assistance is a reimbursement program. Your organization must pay upfront to treat, replace, reconstruct, and repair. In most declared disasters, eligible expenses will be reimbursed at 75%. So even if you have the money to treat, replace, reconstruct, and repair, you will still be left footing eventually 25% of the total costs that are eligible. And you might be footing even more of, un, of ineligible costs. And I hope that thought alone scares you enough to want to be better prepared. FEMA describes two types of work, emergency and permanent. Category letters are assigned for shorthand. Emergency work addresses the immediate threat and permanent work is, as the name infers, is to restore infrastructure primarily, but also buildings and their contents. For cultural institutions, that means collections and furniture needed to display, shelve, and store them. For private nonprofits, Eligible emergency protective measures are generally limited to activities that are associated with preventing damage to an eligible facility and its contents. So those kinds of activities are included here, and they're not anything more or less that are, that's unusual for other facilities. So blue tarping uh, to stabilize or cover roofs and the stabilization of anything, for instance, doorways, um, structures itself, to eliminate or lessen the threat. Cleaning, whether it's wet vacuuming, damp wiping, using HEPA filtered equipment of the interior space to clean and dry out your space. Uh, again, as, as James had mentioned, um, you need to remove anything that got wet, certainly from flooding. So anything that's contaminated, like the gypsum board, plaster, carpet, flooring finishes, and see, even ceiling and permanent light fixtures. And Cleaning of contaminating HVAC systems is really, really important, especially if you've suffered um, a mold outbreak. And that last bullet is one that you might not necessarily think of. If an institution is an eligible applicant, and if collections are moved to get them out of harm's way before a disaster strikes, that's considered eligible work. The effort, the time, um, the expense of moving those collections is considered eligible for reimbursement. If collections are moved after disaster strikes to prevent damage, for instance, to protect collections from getting moldy in a high humidity environment, that's also considered eligible work. Again, my favorite word, well, not my favorite word, but PA's favorite word, eligible, this is for eligible applicants. You need to know what's eligible under category E of permanent work. Collections and individual objects are eligible for treatment under category E if they're damaged as a result of a declared disaster, if they're located within a designated disaster area, and if the institution is an eligible applicant. If you've been deferring maintenance or you fail to take prudent measures to prevent further damage, that damage caused by negligence is not eligible for FEMA assistance. So the stuff get that, the, certainly the first book, the stuff that is filling your, your facility to store and display and preserve and exhibit your collections and other objects is reimbursable. FEMA will treat special collections, but they will not replace anything that's considered rare. Uh, they will pay for treatment of rare books and manuscripts and other fragile ma materials, um, and they will also pay for having a conservator develop a treatment plan for the collection or individual items. Stabilization um, will also be covered by permanent work category E. Uh, the cost associated with restoring an item to pre-disaster, but certainly not 
original condition um, is possible as long as you're not trying to do that uh, with rare materials. So I know this is overwhelming. And again, I encourage you to review. Take a look at Papa G uh, before disaster strikes, or if you're feeling sleepy or you have insomnia, I guess. And remember, 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 I'm available to help you. I'm just an email or uh, four hours later, I think, yes, uh, phone call away. Hentef is here for you. So I'm gonna wrap up by sharing some of Hentef's resources. Uh, these fact sheets were created with Smithsonian subject matter experts to help the public salvage their cherished belongings after a flood and after a fire. They're available for download at this URL at any time. I encourage HENTEF members to encourage their constituents to share these fact sheets with their local library director, museum director, city, town clerk, um, and emergency manager, and you can do the same. HENTEF's robust resources site provides a wealth of information to help cultural stewards, emergency managers, and the public protect cultural and historic resources. We're currently updating our resources pages, but they will, are still online. So stop by and visit anytime. And I'd really love to stop by and visit you in Alaska at some point. Thanks for having me.